world-class guests, fascinating stories, inspiring messages. Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about discovering your calling. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Janice Liggins. Janice is a speaker, TV host, founder of a nonprofit, and author of Journey to Your Calling. Janice helps people uncover their purpose. You can reach Janice and learn more about her book at her website, journeytoyourcalling.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Janice. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you, Linda, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I am so excited to be talking about this journey mm. to discovering your calling. Yes. So if it's okay, I would love to start with your story. How did you discover your calling? And were there any obstacles in the way? It, um, it actually started, it, it was a process. When I say a process, over, a, over several years. It actually started. It actually started with um, one day I just became very sensitive to some community issues that were going on around me. And I, it was almost as if I was in a spiritual state of perception, like I had never been before. And I just kept feeling something is wrong. Something is wrong. But I had no idea what it was. I felt it was pervasive, and, but I just didn't know what it was. And this went on for two years. And it became stronger and stronger. And it was associated with and related to Black men. There was a problem. And I had no idea what it was. And eventually the Lord just led me to different experiences and so forth. Um, one of them was I, was I had the opportunity to be invited into an organization called Leadership Maryland. And it's where Maryland brings together leaders from around the state only 52 at a time. They get hundreds of applications, but they only select about 50. And we, it's a year-long assignment, and it's very, quite a commitment. You have to pack your bags every month, and you're gone two and a half days with this Leadership Maryland program. One of the places we went to was a prison, a maximum security prison. I have never been to a prison. I didn't know the difference between a prison and a jail. And um, I actually thought, I was proud of the fact that I didn't know the difference between a jail and a prison because I thought that world doesn't touch my world. And I was proud of the fact that it didn't touch my world. But pride, I was proud of the fact, yes, but pride is blinding. So I was blind as a bat to what was going on right under my nose. And because I was blind, I know that there are so many other people who are blind. So the Lord put on my heart to get involved in that kind of work. I used to do government contracting. I helped companies get, co get contracts with the federal government. And I did that for my living. And I left all of that to go into the world of prisons and jails and nonprofits. And I knew nothing about any of them. And so, but the Lord had told um, Abraham, leave your land and go into this far distant place I will show you. Well, he did the same thing for me. Leave this familiar and go to this far distant place I will show you. So I'm in a, a totally new world. But as I began to dig and get into it, I took a whole year with, I, all I did was research because I knew nothing. I did a full year from January to December. All I did was research. Well, now I'm walking in my calling. That's the nonprofit. And the name of the nonprofit is the Clarion Call. The Clarion Call is all about prison prevention. So I'm really walking in, living out the calling. We're working with kids, working with families, and so forth. And in the midst of that is when I heard the Lord one day. I was in my kitchen, minding my own business, <laughs> in my kitchen. And I heard the Lord said, write a book. And I paused. I heard that he gave me the title of the book. But the title went right past me because I was still stuck on write a book. <laughs> and I immediately said, Lord, I have nothing to tell the people. So I asked you to write the book through me. And he did. I just started getting idea after idea. They were flowing like water, so much so that I had to keep paper with me at all times. And as the ideas would come, I'd scribble them down. I couldn't write whole sentences. I could only grab a word or a phrase here or there. And that went on for three weeks. 
And at the end of three weeks, it stopped. And so I began to organize all the scribbles into groups. And then I realized those groups had a sequence, what should happen first, second, or last. And I put them in sequence, and then I realized those groups were to be my chapters. And so I put them on an outline, and that was my table of contents. So the whole book was outlined from cover to cover before I had ever written the first sentence. And this is my first book. I never thought to write a book. God just told me to write it, so I was just obeying. But I think he had me write the book. It's called Journey to Your Calling because I am already walking in my calling after those that period of perception, spiritual perception. That was me beginning to get closer to understanding what he wanted. And I think he had me write the book because, you know, everybody who has been put on this planet, every single person, God put us on this planet for us to carry out a specific task, a specific assignment. However, most people, the majority of people, I would venture to say 90% of the people. Or more. Yes, or more, live and die. And they never know what their assignment was. They never know what the task was they were to carry out. And I believe the Lord had me write this book because too many people are living and dying without ever knowing why he put them here. And so it is called Journey to Your Calling and because it is a journey that you must take. You can read the book cover to cover. At the end of reading that book, you will not know what you're calling. You must take the journey. You can't just read the book. I asked the Lord actually, after I had written the book, I said, Lord, how do I promote this book? And he said, it is the book you do. And so you have to do the things in the book, not just read the book. It's like the Bible. You could read the Bible. Reading the Bible does no good if you don't do it, if you don't do the things that are in it. And so the book, um, I'll give you just a quick example. Imagine you're going to go from East Coast to West Coast. You're going to go from D.C. to L.A. And you're going to drive. And so you map out seven different states that you're going to stop in along the way. You might even reserve your hotel in each one of those seven states. Well, but you still don't know what state number one is like because you're still in D.C. So until you get in the car and drive to state number one, check in the hotel, stay overnight, check out some restaurants, sightsee and do some tourism things, then you can say, okay, I understand what that state's like. And you can move on to state number two. You can't skip state number two, and just go straight to state number four. No, you have to drive through state number two, then state number three. Well, the book is the same way. There are seven chapters. Each chapter in the book represents a different state, but it's not a geographic state. Each chapter represents a state of spiritual growth and development. And in each one of those states, the Lord will have you do things. He will tell you to do things. And you have to obey. The number one thing of all is obey. And as we learn to obey God, the more we obey God, the more we will learn to trust him. There's now most people say trust and obey. You know, with God, they'll say trust and obey. And it should be the reverse. Because Mm -hmm. obedience births trust. You don't trust God. Yeah, we trust him because he's God. Okay, but do we really trust him? Do we really trust him enough to do things that make no sense to the natural mind? Because most things God says doesn't make sense to the natural mind because God is not logical. He's God. And so, um, but that's how the book came about. I just obeyed. And even I wrote every day for six months just to finish the first rough draft. But my fingers would just go. I never had one moment of writer's block. And after I finished writing it I, for six months, I put it aside for three months. I don't know why, I just felt led to not touch it. So for three months, I didn't touch it. And when I did go back to it and I opened it up to read, I don't even remember where I opened it, but I got so encouraged. And I thought, Lord, I got encouraged. I wrote it. But no, I didn't. The Lord used me as a vessel through the Holy Spirit to write the book. 
And that's why I was able to get encouraged. And so, and I didn't know all of the information in that book. Um, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, wrote the book through me. So I was learning as I was writing. And even now, even now, when I pick it up, it's still new to me. It's still fresh to me. And, and I appreciate that. Wow. So many beautiful and amazing things that you've brought up. Oh, we're going to have to go back and forth and weave into this. Yeah. I love the idea as you're talking about that we have to go from state one to state two. Mm-hmm. And it's a matter of learning and doing. Mm-hmm. And if we don't do, then it's not like self-help, it's shelf-help. And this is one of the things that Jesus teaches in the Bible. And he teaches the parable about the wise man and the foolish man. And it's a great story. It has great visuals, but a lot of people can just zip right through that story without getting the connection of what makes the wise man wise and what makes the foolish man foolish. Mm -hmm. And the difference is whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. The is like a wise man and whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not mm-hmm. is a foolish man and so that concept of learning and doing is so very important and this is something that a lot of people we miss sometimes we'll listen to something wonderful like we might pick up your book and read it and think oh that was a great read and then go on to the next thing or maybe even listen to this podcast and say oh that was inspiring and then go on to the next thing without taking that step of actually applying that knowledge. And I am a hundred percent on board that this is where the magic take place. It's that combination of learning and doing. And you did that by saying, when you heard that, that voice, that inspiration, say, write a book, you grabbed your pen and your paper and you started writing. And then the next step, just things flow. So well done. Thank you for learning and doing. And being that example of learning and doing. Now, are you going to share these seven steps or do we have to get sure. to hear them? Sure. Okay. Sure. So uh, the first step, um, first chapter is titled Beyond Salvation. Now, most people think, well, if you're saved, that's, that's all you need, right? Well, yeah, it's all you need if all you want to do is go to heaven when you die. But the question is, why did God put you on this planet? We were with him before he put us here. And he's been with us all these years. And if we accept Jesus, we'll be with him at the end when we die. But he put us here for a purpose. And we need to understand what we, what is our purpose? What is our assignment? I, I prefer assignment over purpose. Because really our purpose is to um, be Christ-like. It's, our purpose really is to be and reflect it Christ-like. But our assignment or our task is what's important. And so it's a process of, as you said, learning and doing. So it's equivalent to the school system where you have kindergartners and then elementary school kids and then middle school kids and high school kids and then undergrad and grad and PhD level and so forth. Well, there are even more levels of spiritual growth and maturity. God only knows how many levels there are. But we have to continue to grow spiritually. We have to continually grow spiritually. And one of the ways to do that is to learn what we want. There's a reason we go through everything. And you ever have a situation, we all have had situations, where you figure, why does this keep happening to me? Okay? Everybody's going to do that. Well, it keeps happening because we didn't learn what God wanted us to learn the last time. And it's going to continue to keep happening until we learn what God wants us to learn. So sometimes we handle the situation the way we want. You know, we may uh, handle, if somebody is nasty to us, we'll be nasty back. Or if somebody uh, cuts us off, we're going to cut somebody else. We can't do that. (laughs) You have to always do the way God would be pleased. With. And so I say that he uses, I'm going to grab a bottle of water because I'm going to use it as an object lesson. So we're going to say that this bottle of water is a barbell. Okay. And we go to the gym, right? We use barbells to exercise. 
So it's uh, going to just do like this. And with this water, it's a two pound weight. So it's a two pound weight. I'm going to get a little bit of weight, therefore a little bit of effort and a little bit of muscle strength. Well, let's say this weight is now 10 pounds. I'm going to have to try a lot harder to move and lift that weight. A lot more weight, a lot more effort, but guess what? A lot more muscle strength. Right. Let's say 20 pounds. You have to really try, at least I know I will, to lift that 20 pounds. A lot more weight, a lot more effort, but a lot more strengthening. Well, God uses trial in our lives as spiritual barbells. The trials are there to strengthen our spirit man, just like we use weight to, to strengthen our physical body. God uses trials and tribulations to strengthen our spirit man. And so we become, we're able to endure things more when we're stronger spiritually and more mature spiritually. So when I enter a new trial, I have learned to actually, the trial is God's wink at us, that he's ready to move us to the next higher level of spiritual purpose and maturity. Uh, but first, we have to pass the test. Just like we go to school and take a class, at the end of the class, we have to pass the test. So when we go through a trial, we have to pass the test, we have to, the test of that trial. If we pass that test, meaning handle it the way God would want, uh, then he will move us to the next higher level of spiritual maturity. And he can use us more. As we begin to mature, those trials will get bigger and bigger because you're stronger and you're better able to handle them. He's not going to give you his mem of trials when you're a little baby, as a babe in Christ. And so the more we obey, the more, the stronger we will be. And the more we will realize that we trust God because obedience births trust. Um, if you obey God, then you begin to realize that he, his way is always the better way. Um, I can remember when God told me, I heard, call this person, call that person, go here, go there. And I just thought it was me having an idea, a thought. And I didn't want to call the person. I did not want to call that person. And so I just thought, hmm, I'm not calling them. And I didn't. And so he didn't smack me down or any of that thing. But I, I missed an opportunity. That happened several times. And I would say, hmm, I'm not doing that. I'm not calling them. And then it dawned on me one day, Janice, shut up. That's not God because God does not talk like that. God does not say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I don't have to go here. I don't have to. That's not God. That's the adversary. That small voice that said, call this person. Call that person. That was God. And so the next time I heard that, I made myself do it. I made myself, you know, our spirit has to be stronger than our body or our mind at all times. I made myself call the person. And when I finished the call, I literally just flopped back in my chair in amazement because the whole purpose of that phone call was that person had been thinking of me and wanted to bless me. Really? So the whole purpose of the phone call was for me to get blessed. And so I thought, okay, so this is how it works. And so from then on, I would start to obey. Regardless of how I felt about it, I would just obey. And that began like, I really like that because it always worked out for my good. It was always something that really worked out, you know, good for me. I mean, and that doesn't mean everything speeches and kings free because child, trials and tribulations, the world comes. Mean people will be mean people. And I used to say, Lord, why are they so mean? Why would they say that to me? Why would they do this? Why would they? And I would just be so upset. Why would they act like that? Why would... And he said to me, I hold you 100% accountable for everything you do. Everything you do, everything you say, how you act, and more importantly, how you react. But 
I don't hold you at all accountable for what anyone else does. Well, that was very, very liberating to me, very freeing to me, because I stopped worrying about why other people did things. I only focused on how I handled what they did. Because God sees me and he's holding me accountable for me, but he's holding them accountable for them too. That's another important point because sometimes we're waiting for the justice. It's like, I need some justice. This isn't fair. I don't like unkindness. I don't like cruelty, but also understanding that he will hold them accountable. Exactly. Let's us relax and say, God's got it. I don't need to worry about it. There you go. There you go. And that's very key. That's key because um, God can't, if we get so angry, that we become bitter with the situation or person or whatever, God can't use a bitter heart. He cannot use a bitter, a bitter heart. And God only looks at the heart. He doesn't care how much money we have, how much education we have. He doesn't care how big our house is, how much, he doesn't care about those things. He doesn't care about anything natural. He only cares about our heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we have to very, and he always says, guard your heart with all diligence. And so we have to do that. So um, after the first chapter, the first chapter ends with not only being born and born of his spirit, but being um, filled with his spirit and then being led by his spirit. Being born of his spirit is great. And when you go to, when you die, you'll go to heaven. But in order for you to come into your calling, you have to be filled with his Holy Spirit, and then you have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and literally ask the Holy Spirit to lead, lead me, Heavenly Father, through your indwelling power of your Holy Spirit, lead me, and allow him to lead you. And so we can't have our own way and think it's going to please God. No, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. So... Um, then we have to join a church because he always says to be and you know forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. And then number two is establish a relationship with God. That's chapter number two. You have to get to know God. Well, how do you get to know a stranger? You meet somebody new and you want to get to know them and you talk to them. You tell them all about yourself, they tell you about themselves. You know, where you're from, what you do, what you enjoy. You just keep talking and asking questions. You share your dreams and hopes with them, and they'll share with you. And you want them to know that you can, they can depend on you. You want to make sure that you can depend on them. It's just relationship. He is our father. He is our heavenly father. And establish, talk to him like he is a physical person standing right there with you. Because he is right here with us. And we can talk to him. Just You don't have to use a lot of vows and, and wherefores. And, no, just talk to him like a normal person. And he understands the heart. That's what he's looking at, is the heart. And um, I ask questions all day. Lord, what should I do about this? What, should I, what would you have me do about that? Um, it's just constantly, you know, the Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. And I used to say, God, how can you pray without ceasing? You have to go to work. You have to do this. You have to, how can you pray? <laughs> I didn't understand that. But talking to God all day, you know, telling him how much you love him, telling him thank you for this and thank you for that, praising him all day, asking him questions. What should, would you have me do about this? What would you have me do about that? Lord, I need to be able to do this. Can you, will you help me? Just talk to him. And all of that is getting us to establish that relationship with the Lord. Um, the third chapter is allow God to mature you. Um, there are things in us, there's some, there's some toxic stuff in all of us that needs to be cleaned out before God can really use us. And he can't put clean stuff, you don't put clean food in a dirty pan to cook. You have to clean the pan out. And so we, God wants to do a work in us to clean us up, clean us out spiritually so that the Holy Spirit can't even fill us if we still have all kind of junk and gunk inside of us. And so he wants to do a work in us so that he can then do a work 
through us. And that's the, the process of spiritually developing us to become more of a mature person. And he will purge and prune and perfect us to do that. And we have to always remember that we have to control or possess our range. So what do I mean by that? Like a horse, like a cowboy on a horse, the horse will go anywhere the horse wants if that cowboy just sits there and does not hold the rein. The horse will trot along and just end up meandering wherever you want. The cowboy has to always hold the reins to control where that horse goes. We, as our spirit man, have to control the reins of our flesh man, our natural man. Our flesh will have a mind of its own and wants what it wants when it wants it. And will demand what, how many times have we eaten more potato chips than we knew we should? <laughs> Yeah, done that. Yeah, and you can go from, you can take it from potato chips to marijuana, to, to drugs, to alcohol, to sex. Our flesh wants what it wants. That's why people end up on, you know, uh, on drugs and becoming alcoholics because the body says, give me more of that and we'll demand it. We have to control, we as spirit have to always be in control uh, of our reins and make our body, but no, we're not doing that anymore. You're not having that anymore, no. That's not how we think anymore. You have to always control, be in control. Um, the fourth one is allow God to use you. So after he's cleaned you up and matured you, um, and that's gonna be an ongoing process also, but then he wants to be able to use you. Remember, he wants to do a work in us so he can then do a work through us but he will actually use us. And um, most times when he tells us to do things, it won't make sense to our natural mind, but that's okay. That's okay. If you know it's God, just obey, just do it. Because a lot of things that he um, tells us to do will not make sense to the natural mind, but just trust, just do it. And you will see the faithfulness of God to come through. Um, in every bad situation, you want to look for the good. No matter, so trials and tribulations are going to come and they can be really bad. But no matter how bad the situation is, there's always something good in the midst of every bad situation. As I was coming into my calling, everything around me was crumbling. I call it in the book I write about it, the time of my 10 alligator trials. And it felt like when Peter was walking on the water, he did good as long as he kept both eyes on Jesus. But the minute Peter started looking down, meaning looking at his situation, that's when he began to sink. So when I was going through that period of spiritual perception, I, I mean, I, everything was crumbling all around me. Each thing was enough for it to wipe somebody out. And I had like 10 simultaneous. That's why I call it the time of my 10 alligator trial. But the good thing is, the good thing that was happening is that when I was with that Maryland, Leadership Maryland organization and I was going away each month, that was the good thing that was happening. I saw God in that. I, you know, and even, even with that, I knew God was leading me somewhere with that. So that kept me, even though everything else was falling down and falling apart. And what I realized later, God will open doors that he wants us to go through, but he will also close them. So all of those things that seemed to be falling down, there were doors that God was closing because he had me going in a whole different direction with my life, walking into my calling. I didn't realize that's what it was at the time. That's yeah. great that you made it through that. So what's the next step? So the next step is fight the good fight of faith. So once you get through um, allowing God to mature you and allowing God to use you, the adversary is not going to like that. So a little bit more things may start coming at you. But that's all right. God has your back. You don't have to. I always say never fret what the devil is doing. Don't worry about anything that the adversary is doing. The, because the adversary is God's problem. God knows what's going on. 
and just thank God for protecting you from all her harm or danger, seen and unseen, and just glorify the Lord in everything you do. Let the Lord take, don't ever focus on what the enemy is doing. He's the enemy. Don't waste your time on the enemy. The enemy is God's problem. Today is the only day that faith will work. Today is the only day faith will work. You don't worry about next week, next week and next month. Obey today. Whatever he tells you to do today, do that. Stay there and do that. So what was the next step? The next one is love. Love is the greatest commandment. And we have to love. We have to have a heart that loves. We have to love first. You know, hate is not of God. And he doesn't like anger. He does not like bitterness. He doesn't, we can't get revenge on people. That's just not God. We have to love. And love, he says even love your enemy. So when people are acting nasty or mean or doing things, pray for them. Pray for them because the main thing you have to do is remember, don't focus on what they're doing because God is holding them accountable as well as he's holding you accountable for what you do. I've actually been able to pray for people in the midst of them being mean or ugly. I've been able to pray for them because they're just in a dark and ugly place right then at that moment. Beautiful. That's the Martin Luther King quote where he says, darkness cannot chase out darkness. Only light can do that. And only light cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Only love can do that. Yeah. So yeah. the very last one is walk in your calling. And making it through that love. God is love. God is love. We cannot love apart from God. We can like, we can admire, but we really cannot love apart from God because God is love. And so that, that's a key chapter because it makes us examine ourselves and our relationship with God. You know, is it real or, you know, are we faking or what, what's the situation? And once we go past that love chapter, which is chapter six, the seventh and last chapter is just walk in your calling. Which you know, back to that learn and do and that faith without works. So it is about, this is beautiful. A journey includes that doing, moving and doing. So yeah. Janice, thank you for sharing your wisdom. I'm so grateful that you listen, that you obey, that you are following your calling so that you can help other people discover theirs. So thank you. And thank you for visiting with me today. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me as well. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Steve Furtick. He said, you can't fulfill your calling in your comfort zone. Today, I invite you to step outside your comfort zone into your growth zone and begin a journey to your calling. See you next time on Linda's Corner.